Well, in the interest of time, it's nearly six o'clock, so we thought we'd get started. Um, and just to let you know that uh, we're apparently a number of panels in the evening are experiencing uh, very interested and engaged people, but not many of them, and there are competing events. So we've been told if we want to, uh, if we do end early, if we run out of questions and conversation, it's okay for us to say we're done and you can go on to another panel or go on to your evening's activities. My name is Leslie Durgan and I'm the moderator and I want to welcome you to the Endless Struggle for Reproductive Rights. Uh, this is session 4965. And we're going to uh, manage it, I think, depending on the number of people, with offering the opportunity to have you write uh, your questions on cards. Um, instead of texting, because there really aren't many of us here. And somebody just... Would you be willing to go through it for the online audience? Ah, uh, yes, of course. So, so the way that you, as I understand it, and I am a neophyte at this, that you do, uh, if you want to text, is and help me out. Somebody knows this better than I do. You know it better than I do. <laughs> so I think what you do... Oh, right here, okay. So what you do is you text UMC 235, and then you text that number, UMC 235, to 37607. 37607 once to join, and then you text your message or your question. So we're gonna try to manage it both ways to see if we can, especially given the limited number of people here, see if we can promote some conversation, but we'll also be open to texting. So I'd like to uh, really invite your, your participation in this um, very interesting topic and to welcome our two panelists, one of our third person couldn't attend, uh, Kathleen Adams and Marilinda Garcia are here. And I think Marilinda, you're going to begin. I'm not going to do their bios because they're in the programs. So Marilinda, if you want to start, then Kathleen will talk and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions and conversation. Thanks so much for having me and for being here. Um, I will just introduce myself so you have some context um, about who I am and uh, how I came to be here in case you don't have a program on you. Um, I come from the East Coast. I was born in Boston. My mom uh, is from Italy. My dad is from New Mexico, so I have a lot of family um, in this general vicinity. Um, I attended Tufts University and New England Conservatory of Music. I did a double degree program there. My first career ambition was to be an orchestral harpist, um, and I enjoyed uh, traveling internationally, performing with um, orchestras all over the place. It was fantastic, one of the most enriching uh, parts of my life thus far. I subsequently moved into the public policy realm. Um, I have a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and I ran for office when I was 20, 23 years old in the state of New Hampshire. I served four terms as a state representative and um, then won um, a nomination for Congress in my state in 2014. I did not win the general election, however, and I am now the spokesperson for a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit called the Libre Initiative, which does policy advocacy and educational outreach related to economic opportunity. So I'm uh, happy to be talking about this very important uh, topic today. Um, I think it's clear that uh, reproductive rights is something that is of utmost importance not only to women as individuals in the different societies from which we were born um, and grow up and come of age in, but also in terms of the policies and systemic um, ways that society um, basically creates um, situations and policies and practices that really do a lot to stimmy um, a woman's right to um, live the life she chooses. And um, that has very serious geographic, um, economic, excuse me, demographic and economic ramifications worldwide. Um, there are, of course, a number of issues we hear about um, that um, are 
really concerning and, and relate to this, one of course being female genital mutilation, which is um, a way to control a woman's um, sexual pleasure and, um, and also in a you know, patriarchal um, <clears throat> society is a way for women to be oppressed and you know, men to um, exert control. Um, there's also the issue of, um, which is both domestic and international, but of course abortion um, policies range widely in you know, many different countries for many different reasons, but when it comes to women and girls, um, there is very concerning effects of gender side wherein, again, because of systemic, um, cultural, um, religious, societal, societal um, um, biases, as particularly in China, India, and Pakistan, in fact, the number of girls um, that are uh, selectively aborted just due to their gender um, is causing, frankly, a societal crisis in those parts of the world. The Economist recently um, did a study <clears throat> and uh, showed that in China, they are on track to have more single men than the entire male population of America. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mentioned India and Pakistan as well. The rate is in the millions and that can really lead to um, unrest, uh, societal unrest, social instability, and of course uh, economic instability as well. So that's quite concerning. On the domestic front, um, it's obviously a very contentious um, issue within public policy. And um, as with most issues, it seems, in this country, it's, it's a bit unfortunate that uh, within you know, the two-party system that we have, it does seem as though any debate about it ends up becoming um, a debate about the extremes, um, very marginal arguments um, in that within that topic, of course, it's complex. Um, there is so much room for agreement, humanity, and compassion between the two extremes, which are you know, abortion for any reason, a child doesn't have rights or isn't born or considered human until it leaves the hospital, to uh, banning all of contraception. Um, so you know, most people do not fall on one side or the other on that, and there's a lot of agreement um, and also debate to be had in the center. So um, obviously the states and the federal government are working through many, many different considerations and with the developments in healthcare, science and technology, um, there's a lot more we can learn. So um, that is sort of my, my general uh, synopsis about um, all of the things to consider under this umbrella and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions when you have some, but thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mary. So let's turn now to Kathleen and uh, have you talk and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. Sure. Kathleen? Yeah, perfect. So my name is Kathleen Adams. Um, I live in New York City and I'm actually going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how I actually got involved in reproductive rights. Um, it, it's kind of a crazy journey, but I think you might find it um, interesting. So. Um, I got involved with reproductive rights and the movement essentially through the time in high school that I spent volunteering with Planned Parenthood of Greater Cleveland um, in Cleveland, Ohio, or in Ohio, in the state of Ohio, actually at the time when I was growing up, um, we had pretty great funding for Planned Parenthood. Then with certain legislation that changed and uh, political pressure, that situation drastically changed. So you used to be able to get birth control completely for free. It still is free at Planned Parenthood. But then the need for donations to cover the, um, your monthly supply and whatnot, um, there was more pressure on it. So it went from being free to like a $5 suggested donation to a $10 suggested donation to an increasing amount. And for myself, I knew that I could afford the donation required, but for many individuals who are looking for low cost or free birth control options, that was seen as a burden. So um, I got involved with Planned Parenthood at Greater Cleveland High School. Um, lobbied in Columbus, Ohio with different legislators, knocked on doors, did petition writing, was greatly involved. Um, I went to college, to Fordham University, and um, 
between the transition between high school and college, and even during college, I got involved with a nonprofit called Choice USA. So Choice USA is a mobilization um, organization to inspire and teach young leaders about the reproductive justice movement. So in terms of RJ, the point is the right to be a parent, the right to not be a parent, and the right to parent your child. So that's kind of the framework that we were working in, working with at the time. Um, we received um, leadership trainings, we lobbied on the Hill, we had action organizing sessions. So it was like a really great momentum that was built up. And then in college, um, or right before I started college was when um, Hurricane uh, Katrina occurred. And on the Gulf Coast, it drastically impacted the way that women access, it, access um, reproductive health uh, services. So when I was in college, a friend of mine uh, with the organization I used to intern at was called Pro-Choice Public Education Project. Um, her name's Nora Dye, and she was really fascinated with how women on the Gulf Coast received healthcare services. And so we decided to create a coalition of women one summer and ride our bikes from New Orleans to New York City to study and interact with women to see what their climate was like in terms of health services. We decided to do it on our bikes because the bicycle was actually the first form of transportation that women could use without being accompanied by a man. So it was very liberating seeing a multi-generational group of 20 women ride 1,600 miles across the Gulf Coast. So, so we did that and it was fascinating. Even though people might not have been pro-choice um, on the, of those that we interviewed on the, on the bike tour, we all kind of had the same mission in terms of at least the side that I'm on. We wanted to see greater expanded health services for women. And the, a lot of the, the residents noticed that because of Hurricane Katrina, um, clinics were shut down and weren't being reopened. Um, daycare centers were, were closed and only one was, one was a hub. There used to be 10 in the neighborhood. Just the family life dynamics changed completely. So for me, it was a really great hands-on experience. And then um, during that time, I actually founded my nonprofit that I call Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen. So Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen is a reproductive justice framework organization where we talk about issues and ideas through hip hop. Um, the reason why we do it through hip hop and why we frame it through reproductive justice is because the pro-choice movement oftentimes frames it as it just being um, about health services, but it's more than just the health services. It's about the woman, her family, her choices, and the community around her. And so also in a lot of communities of color, um, it's hard to say the word pro-choice and reproductive, reproductive justice is a, is a more, um, I don't wanna say an easier term, but a, a more accepted term. And it's a framework that, that's kind of worked a bit better. So with Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen, we do talk about pro-choice issues. We do try to rally the community to, um, if, to um, ask for expanded birth control, um, daycare centers, healthy access, um, healthy food options, um, in terms of, in terms of just like safer communities. So that's what Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen is, and it's been, um, it's been a unique journey with it because our event is in the South Bronx, which is the poorest congressional district in the nation, and oftentimes, um, a lot of pro-choice or reproductive justice conversations aren't occurring in these communities. So it's been great to be able to frame a conversation where all feel welcomed and where everyone kind of feels like they're on the same playing field. So that's, that's my journey with um, reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Great. <clears throat> Thank you both. Let me remind people that you can uh, text a question by texting UMC 235 and then you text that to 37607 once to join and then text your question or your message. We do have one, but I'm, before we get to that uh, and invite anyone in the audience who wants to use text and then we'll also open it up to the conversation here um, to see if either of you wanna respond to each other, anything that, uh, that either you, Marilinda, said that Kathleen wants to respond to or ask a question or vice versa. Um, I'm impressed with your political background and all that you've accomplished. Um, for you, have you made um, reproductive, reproductive rights a uh, central part of your campaigns in the past or? Um, yeah, I support women's rights and that means a woman's right to live the life she chooses 
um, according to her terms. And I think that a lot of the times what is conflated in the political arena and used as a, frankly, uh, battering ram of sorts is, again, kind of forcing, and I know you're trying to use you know, different language to maybe uh, counteract this a bit, but you know, force someone into are you pro-choice or pro-life, and that's it. And what does that really mean? Um, you know, it's interesting in this country, at, at least in recent years, certainly this one, um, the debate and most contentious issue that has kind of been at the public consciousness and the political uh, realm is about abortion, but only tangentially. It really has to do with freedom and um, the choice as citizens to be sure that your resources are used for things that you do not uh, oppose on a conscientious uh, basis. So again, it's been about abortion, but it's actually been about taxpayer funding for ab abortion services. And you know, uh, this whole debate about Planned Parenthood and you know har the harvesting of uh, body parts of fetuses. Um, you know, it, it comes down to the big issues that we talk about. Um, when it comes to what are real negative forces in our political process, and that's lobbying, and that's the outsized influence of money in campaigns. And so um, I, there's a lot of rhetoric that would say that anyone you know, who opposes Planned Parenthood is really just opposed to choice completely and therefore opposed to women. But really, it's that if there's an organization that receives about $500 million in taxpayer uh, funded, uh, excuse me, federal funding, which is of course comes from taxpayers, shouldn't you have a right as a citizen to be sure that that money isn't used for practices that you may have a conscientious objection to? And so, um, and if you think about it, of course money is fungible. So, you know, there have been all these congressional hearings and um, there are accusations, you know, flying around in, in both directions. But at a certain point, you can say that, well, we received this money, um, 500 million, and, uh, and a, another 500 million actually comes directly from abortion services and say, well, you know, that's used for women's health and women's health centers. Well, there are lots, actually, thousands. Um, I think about, actually, I, I wrote it down. There's a uh, 13,000 at least publicly funded alternatives um, to Planned Parenthood. There are uh, 2,000 pregnancy health care support centers that don't receive public funding. So there are a lot of alternatives. And when an organization is able to use money that comes from taxpayers to then lobby members of Congress to support them, um, and their candidates that support, you know, blanket uh, choice, if you will, that is abortion up until, uh, for any reason, up until the baby leaves the hospital. There, you know, there's a lot of questions within that. So it, it's not a measure of, are you just pro-choice or pro-life? Um, it has to do with our political process. And overall, when, you know, as a society, it's incumbent upon us to uh, decide who we are um, and you know what we believe um, is how we should conduct ourselves in these matters. There's actually a lot of consensus um, that would bring us in line to, frankly, most other countries, uh, with the exception of um, China and uh, North Korea, I believe, actually, that, for example, don't allow for abortions after 20 weeks, which is when a fetus, uh, the pain receptors and, you know, um, spinothalamus, uh, thalamic pathways are established. That's when, you know, they feel pain. And so a lot of countries have that policy. And so the vast majority of Americans actually, based on studies, agree that um, there's consensus that we should think hard, hard about um, where we're going to draw the line. Um, and then this but goes into all sorts of bioethics. Don't you think, um, in terms of um, in terms of how far in term you're able to um, access different um, procedures, throughout the years, it's actually it's, it's changed quite a bit. So yeah, it is about 20 weeks at this point, but it's actually different on a state to state level. But with, for example, Texas is a great example. Um, how many they have about what three, two to three clinics that you can actually only access 
um, abortion services at now. I know at least in the state of Ohio, um, when I, I've had an abortion, I'm open about it, whatnot. I was 18 in high school, chose to, um, chose that it was just not a time for me to be a parent, but I remember how difficult it was, even though I'm a person of means, to the law in Ohio change where you had to um, get a, like a pregnancy certificate, signed off, then schedule an appointment where it was more like a counseling appointment where they would counsel you through your options, then they would show you, legally they could show you pictures of, of aborted fetuses, whatnot, to try to sway your opinion. Then you had to wait another 24 hours, come back, have the procedure done, but right before you had the procedure done, you had, you were kind of, you had the option to see your ultrasound, which is absolutely unnecessary for such a procedure. So imagine being in a state where you can't access, you can't take off of work for what, two, three days to make these back-to-back -back appointments. You are gonna go up against that 20 week period of time. And I think, in my opinion, I feel like the political climate has made it in such a way where women can't access health services when they need it prescribed under the 20 weeks, so. Well, certainly, yeah, there are a lot of ways to look at it. Uh, that never came up in New Hampshire. We, you know, we don't even actually require licensing of abortion facilities um, in New Hampshire. One thing that did come up a lot was uh, parental notification um, uh, debate, if you will, in legislation. And basically the two sides, uh, the two main arguments were, one, uh, if a young woman were to find herself you know, in a situation where she were being uh, you know, compelled one way or the other and her parents are either not a source you know, of emotional or financial or whatever type of support that she would need um, at the time and she isn't comfortable approaching them for again a whole, whole host of reasons um, that um, can occur, you know, does that put her, to your point, um, in, in a precarious situation? But on the other hand, um, uh, the other side would say, and this was where I fell in that you know, we require parental, um, actually not even notification, but consent for uh, handing out aspirin at school, for getting a tattoo, for even going into a sun tanning parlor. So what we were able to do was um, pass a parental notification bill, um, but of course allow for a judicial um, exception where if there were a, an issue, you know, with a, young uh, girl not um, being comfortable or you know, not having uh, that, that uh, relationship with her parents where she could approach them or you know, whatever the issue may be, um, that she could get an exemption to that. So that's one way where I think uh, states, um, it's, it's healthy that they figure out what's best for their citizens um, and for women and um, find a solution. Okay, we're starting to get some texted questions. Um, so let me also urge anyone in the audience, if you would prefer to use a three by five card instead of a text, please raise your hand and Rachel can, can get you a card and we'll read these questions as well as the text. Okay, and then depending on how far we get, we may just open it up for conversation as well. Um, and let me see, what I'm trying to do is accommodate anyone who identifies that they're a student to ask that question first. And I don't see that anyone has, has self-identified as a student, so I'm just gonna take them in order. How's that? How is it that the mobilized minority of anti-choice Americans are able to have such an outsized influence of policy on policy when the American majority is largely, and the text stops out, I'm gonna say, largely pro-choice, I'm filling in that last word. So how is it that a mobilized minority of anti-choice Americans have such an outsized influence on policy? I'd be happy to jump on that. Please. Um, of course, sure, okay, anti-choice, pro-life, I think that's what we're talking about. Um, it's, it's just the same as the other side, lobbying, political influence, campaign contributions, um, anytime you have a um, activist and, and this is the interesting part. On the pro-life side, it's by and large um, activist based. Um, you know, they're not, they're not getting, uh, 
they don't have an industry, if you will. You know, there, there's no pro-life industry, whereas there are some arguments that, uh, again, with Planned Parenthood, that this, it is an industry and they uh, do uh, have a revenue stream from that industry. So again, it comes down to how effectively do you lobby your elected representatives uh, based on the votes they take? Uh, will you contribute to their campaigns? And, um, and I think, you know, there are parts of the country where um, it's, a, it's a big issue um, and people feel very strongly about it. I, I don't, I, the nature of the question, I, I'm, I guess I'm happy because I consider myself pro-life that they feel that that minority is <laughs> so effective because I, I frankly don't. But um, I, I think, again, really actually with amongst Americans, there's, there's a lot of common ground, so. Kathleen, do you want to? I, I would um, echo what she, what she said, but I also think at the same time, you have to think geographically um, where people are situated. So I'll tell you a, a story how it relates to back to the movement. So um, other week, I, I live in New York City. There's a ton of things to do. I could see a play. I could uh, go to a concert. I could go to a restaurant. I could go to a bar. I could do whatever I want to do. It's New York City. Things are open 24-7. But I found myself one Friday night um, up in Harlem going to a free church play. And I said to my friend, I was like, wait, this is so weird. We're going to a free event at a church on a Friday night in New York City? I've had to pinch myself. I'm like, I'm not in Ohio anymore. Like, what's up? <laughs> um, so, but how this relates back into why things are funded or like how there's such a movement behind um, like the pro-life movement is because a lot of people are alienated in their communities where the church or religious institutions or certain cultural groups kind of dominate activities and options in a community. And at least for a fact, I went to Fordham University. I'm extremely pro-choice. I was on student government when I was in college on the finance committee, and the school paid for student activists to protest outside of Planned Parenthoods in, in the Bronx with school funding, with our tuition dollars. I spent $65,000 a year at Fordham and they're using my money to, to pay or to fund activists to do this, while at the same time, it wasn't a balanced activity where they would allow pro-choice students to um, pay for a speaker or go to a conference that was all self-funded. So I think that when you grow up in a society where, um, where you're told, you know, you might, you might not know anything about the pro-choice or pro-life movement, but you might be, just be told, pro-life is this, this is how we're going to live, and you continue just growing up and you don't really ask questions, I think that's where people start to just continue funding movements without really being as knowledgeable. Um, my best friend, he is Catholic. He claims he's a Republican, but I feel he sways more Democratic at times. Um, and, he, and, he, and he says that he's, um, he's pro-life, but when we start talking about issues, things that are important, things to support, I feel like he sways more on the pro-choice side. He might not wanna say it, but he believes that you know, all women have the right to be a parent when, when it's their time to be a parent. All women have the choice to parent their child when they actually have a child. And all, all women have the choice to, to decide not to have a kid. And that's a reproductive justice framework. So it's not just pro-choice. It's about saying, here's how I understand a woman and her, and her needs holistically entirely versus just focusing on the fact that she has a uterus that can produce a child. So I think when you frame it that way and you're like, hmm, would I rather have my money go to or towards having a, a healthy, productive family versus paying later down the road for juvenile delinquency, for, um, for, for families who don't have enough food, for schools that are underfunded because, um, because there aren't great teachers? If you look at it in an RJ framework, it makes sense to kind of support that. So I think that we need to reframe what we're saying to get more supporters, and I think that those on the pro-life side might come over. Um, can I of course jump in on that for please um, yeah um, a, a few two examples actually from personal experience of just how kind of ineffective these uh, sort of lobbying and activist um, or maybe not ineffective because clearly they're effective in at least creating gridlock on the issue um, but more intellectually dishonest, I guess you could say, or uh, really just not helping to promote the common good, if you will. 
Um, so in one instance, you know, as when you're running in a federal election, there are all sorts of different sur surveys and questionnaires you have to fill out uh, to try and uh, glean support from, you know, various organizations that uh, do lobbying or, you know, activism or whatever the case may be. And um, there were a number of them that would be considered, you know, on the pro-life side that, you know, I, I couldn't score highly on and couldn't get support from because I... Uh, didn't, um, excuse me, I, I was not opposed to the morning after pill, for example. Um, and, you know, that isn't because if we're intellectually honest, according to science, we, we do know that life of, in some capacity begins there. You know, when is a, a, uh, a embryo or fetus and then, you know, human imparted with a soul, when can it feel pain? There are stages of development, but, you know, just because you have a personal belief about that, we can accept it, but that doesn't mean that in policy practice, you know, that's something that is absolutely necessary um, that you be a stickler for. But then on the other hand, um, in the New Hampshire legislature, um, in bringing our state in line with federal law and the federal ban on partial birth abortion, which is very late term abortion on, you know, uh, a baby that would be viable, you know, outside of the womb, um, I voted for that. It was Republicans and Democrats voted for it. It was an overwhelming um, majority that passed it. And yet ads were run against me by the pro-choice uh, side. And um, that, of course, in fine print, it referenced that bill that I had voted on. But what the ad depicted was uh, police cars pulling up to a hospital and policemen, you know, the sirens flashing and everything, running in and dragging doctors and women out in handcuffs. And it said, this is what, you know, Mary Linda Garcia wants to do. And of course, then they referenced that bill, <laughs> which, you know, so clearly that's intellectually dishonest as well. So it's really unfortunate that that's where we're at, but uh, that's politics, I guess. So I'm gonna go to a question from uh, one of you, and then we do have a number of texts questions as well. Recognizing the power of words and the positive ring and power of pro-life, what do you think about not using that self-identification of pro-life, but to be clear in calling them anti-choice or something like that? So the question is pro-life, anti-choice, language is powerful, how do you respond to that? It's all semantics, so like, like, she and I might agree on certain things that like in your movement of the pro-life movement might not seem completely pro-life and on the pro-choice movement might not seem like completely pro-choice, but I think there's a middle ground that like pro-life, pro-choice like come together. And like, I think at the end of the day, I think that we agree that like a woman's health is the, is, is the main priority. Like women need to be healthy. Where we start to divide is at what point, do, at what point in a pregnancy should a woman have choices or or what options she should make? And I don't think that it's, I don't think that you're anti-choice. I just think that like you you just have, or you represent um, a community legislator, legislation, whatnot. So, but your beliefs kind of just come to a certain point where my beliefs would kind of um, funnel off more. But there are more extreme people who who do say that like um, conception begins when, when you have sex. And I don't think that's your opinion. And that would, that for me, that would be completely anti-choice. I, I do think it's an issue of semantics. Obviously, it's when you're trying to build public support for something, one, people like to identify with something that sounds more positive, obviously. So hence, both sides use pro, right? <laughs> pro one thing, pro the other thing. And uh, then we would, uh, you know, against each other, say anti-choice and anti-life. And it is just semantics and, you know, but everything comes down to marketing. So there's that aspect of it. But, but, but technically, kind of with the framework that I'm working in, you're not technically like pro-life because you do believe in choice. Sure. Right, so I'm saying, but like, so shouldn't there, shouldn't there be like a category for like those of us who like, like okay, we agree on this. Sure, no, I, that would be wonderful. I just, um, I guess we'll have to carve that out. <laughs> so. Work to be done, yeah. clearly. Okay, let's go to the, the texts and invite any of you who wanna use a three by five card, to please raise your hand and one of our producers will make sure that you have the, the material you need, okay? Uh, in the order in which they arrived, why in 2016 is this still a contentious issue? 
And I guess I'd add, do you think it'll ever become less contentious or not contentious um, at all? <laughs> uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I guess wait and see. Um, you know, um, I think over time, you know, everything is cyclical and, you know, things change over time. And, uh, you know, I think there's a whole variety of um, reasons, you know, confluence of factors as to, you know, what Americans care about, what are the political debates. Um, and I think we've been actually fortunate in this country up until now to be able, you know, to expend so much time and energy and passion on this issue. Um, and, uh, but, you know, as technology and uh, the whole realm of bioethics uh, continues to get quite complex, I think actually rather than uh, simplifying the, I think maybe it may simplify by expanding if that makes sense. I mean, now within our legal frameworks and, you know, again in the bioethics realm, we have issues about, um, you know, can we do genetic uh, predetermination? Can uh, scientists can now create an embryo with three parents? You know, I mean, there's there's so many things that can be done. I, is it right to um, engineer our children and you know choose what characteristics and traits that we want them to have? I mean, these are all kind of choice and reproductive issues, um, and. I think they're still um, not that commonplace, but things develop so fast um, in science and technology, um, in the innovation economy, and in that respect, the you know again bioethics realm. I, I think I think it'll change in years to come. I just don't know how. No, I would completely echo um, echo what you're saying. Um, I think that with access to new technology and to um, to innovation completely, the landscape is going to change. But I think, though, that scientists are intelligent individuals who are ethical. So I don't think it's ever going to be an issue that we need to really worry about where we're going to say, oh, um, Susie and Kevin are going to only engineer their child to have blonde hair and blue eyes. Like, I don't think that that's something that we need to worry about. I think right now the focus is kind of helping women who don't have access to naturally um, produce children to be able to do that. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic, they actually just did an amazing um, pilot program for women who are unable to have children by doing a uterine, um, um, a, uh, a uterine replacement, I guess you could say. So it was uh, someone's passed away, they've done a uterine transplant, and they're trying to help these women who tragically have medical issues have children. So I think by focusing time and intention on, on things like that, it's important, but for um, I don't think that um, I don't think that um, I don't know what the word I want to say, but I, I don't think that we need we need to really be focused on on the misuse of science because scientists wouldn't um, steer us the wrong way in this day and age with with ethical guidelines put in place. I guess I would just say I I agree, except that's the point um, in in the policy realm. The job is to determine what those parameters are. And so a lot of things, for example, in the cybersecurity space right now, it's almost you can't even create policy to keep up with the uh, cyber risks that we have um, when, you know, when it comes to our critical infrastructure and you know, our general grid and whatnot. It's actually a huge uh, concern when it comes to national security. and uh, and policy can't even keep pace with it in some respects. So, I mean, there, there are currently um, biotech boutique firms that actually do allow you to choose, you know, if your children, what color hair, what color eyes, um, and certain uh, um, determiners like that. And so, in some ways, it's, it's difficult because you want to allow, of course, science and technology to push the envelope because there are so many good things they do. But uh, sometimes you end up with unintended consequences, and um, then the uh, those in the policy realm are left to kind of pick up the pieces and, and make decisions on behalf of the betterment of society. So it's 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 hard. I kind of actually disagree. Um, so when doctors get sworn in with their white coat ceremony, they swear in to say that they will do good by society, humanity, take care of their patients, and like 
give it back, pay, pay their knowledge forward by improving society. So with that in place, that's actually more of the governing board that I'd be more, um, not concerned with, but I'd be channeling my attention to because they are actually the professionals versus policy make, policymakers. They may have had experience being a doctor, a surgeon, something in the medical field, but I would trust the judgment and the advice of um, someone from the American Medical Association over like my congressman. I, I guess I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that, um, and I'm not questioning the intentions or you know uh, capabilities of doctors or scientists. I'm just saying that in discovering things and creating capabilities within that realm, if you then harness technology and science, we are allowed to create companies that do certain things. Um, you know that's how all uh, basically the whole IVF. Um, um, capabilities that's a huge industry now you know it's it's not as though individual doctors were making decisions about that they just were doing that to help um, to your point the betterment of society but now we end up having ethical questions about for example when uh, one that comes up sometimes is uh, you know when you have all of these uh, fertilized embryos you know is it okay to discard them you know so I'm just saying questions arise with the develop these uh, developments in healthcare and science, and so sometimes the policymakers are kind of brought to make decisions. It's not that they're the ones. No, I, can, I completely do it. No, I understand. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this question is actually for you, Kathleen. It's come in several times, uh, but I suspect because the words are all the same from the same person. Can you speak to some of the differences in access to reproductive services? in low-end communities of color versus white affluent communities? Yeah, so when I chose to have my abortion, I had great health insurance. It covered it, what not. Um, at that time, I was actually working at Planned Parenthood, and I made the choice to go to Planned Parenthood to have my procedure done amongst, amongst my peers and in an environment that I trusted. Um, with someone with private insurance who could go to a private hospital to have the procedure done, I could have chosen that. But I wanted to walk in the shoes of my patients that I was working with at the time to feel what it felt like for them. Um, I think that to be, uh, I'll talk about Cleveland, I can only talk about my own experiences. So though there may have been eight Planned Parenthood campuses in Cleveland in terms of health clinic facilities, there was only one clinic, because legally you could not have a clinic that perform normal well women health care to perform abortions. So due to funding, there was only a clinic that was operated two days a week that you could go to to receive abortion care. Um, low income women would go there. I can't um, tell you the statistics if more women of color went there than not, but it was more, of, it was a free clinic, so of course low income women went there. We had amazing doctors who practiced at university hospitals, Kaiser Permanente, Cleveland Clinic, whatnot. So we had outside doctors come in twice a week to perform these services. I personally had a great experience. I was very comfortable. It was very professional. And, um, and, I, and I thank them for allowing me to continue living the life that I've been able to live thus far. That's not the situation in every community. Um, it's, I'm not gonna say that it's like, oh, let's think about like back alley abortions with low income communities, but back to the situation where, where there are laws in place where you have to wait legally 24 hours, you have to get this paperwork signed, and you have to jump, jump over this hurdle and that hurdle, it is difficult for low income community members to access this very necessary procedure. So in my opinion, I think that we're truly, really hurting young women and low income women who don't have the means to take time out of their lives to meet all these mandates to access the services. So in my opinion, I feel like we are, um, I, I feel like we're just doing a disservice to our women in, a, in effect into our communities. Um, some may disagree, but that's, that's how I feel. Um, it's, you definitely have a privilege if you have insurance that covers abortion and you can go to a private hospital that, that um, conducts the procedure. But due to Obamacare, you actually cannot, uh, no federal funding is allowed to cover abortion, so it's still the same situation. It's just repackaged in a different way. Okay, what role do you think sexual education plays in the issue of reproductive rights? I think it's a really important one. And again, this is an excellent opportunity to, um, as we do in everything else, harness all of the amazing uh, developments in technology. I mean, you think about you know these Fitbits that 
everybody wears and, you know, different ways to monitor everything, you know, that's going on with our bodies. And I think it would be great if young women were um, empowered in such a way, uh, you know, that went beyond what is, I guess I haven't looked, I haven't sat in on a sex ed class in a, you know, in a school recently, but it seems like um, it's talked about in very simplistic ways in terms of, uh, you know, sexuality and uh, pregnancy and, you know, all of, all of the different, uh, if you will, uh, um, ramifications of, you know, sexual activity among uh, young people. So I think it would be great if maybe we expanded it um, in ways that w could bring women more in touch with, you know, the natural forces in her body when it comes to, you know, tracking ovulation and understanding, you know, how these things affect um, hormones. And I just, I don't know, I, I think there's just a lot, a lot that could be done. And um, I, I just think it would be great if everyone could think outside the box when it comes to um, contraception and sex education as well. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of great minds that could do some awesome things on that. Yeah, from and I guess for me, I don't think sex ed is just about sex, about um, condom use, about birth control, whatnot. I think it's more about like healthy living, being a healthy being. So health and wellness, um, appropriate touch, um, stress management, um, mental uh, mental health issues, like really understanding who you are as a person. Because when you're an adolescent, your hormones are raging. One day you're happy, one day you're sad, one day you're laughing, one day you're crying. Like nothing is stable in your life. And of course, when your hormones are fluctuating, you're, you're experiencing all these different things. And I think that a lot of times we just take the route of here's how to put a condom on, um, here's how to put a condom on, like here's what spermicide is, um, here's what it means to ovulate. But I think we really need to start thinking about the whole entire person and not have it just be in ninth grade. Um, I remember in fourth grade we had the period talk and we, you know, we had to put the um, vagina puzzle together. We learned about body parts and well, my mom's a gynecologist and so she actually helped like teach like that, that, that module at the all girls school I went to, but it was great. And, um, once you feel comfortable with who you are and what your being is, you're going to feel more comfortable advocating for yourself outside of the classroom, perhaps in the bedroom, perhaps in a car if that's if that's the place that you're going to get it on at. But <laughs> I think, but but not to be funny about it, I think you really just need to understand who you are. Um, I don't remember who it was, but um, my mom went to Vassar. This is the story. So my mom went to Vassar. It used to be an all-women's college. When she began at Vassar, there was a couple guys there. I think she took like a women's studies class involved with art and the teacher told her, the teacher was not there, but the assignment was to lie down on a bed, take a mirror and look at yourself naked, to explore your body, to see what your insides look like. You never see what your insides look like. Your partner may, but you may never see that. So just to have that knowledge base and feel powerful and to feel equipped that like, this, like, this is my labia, like this is my clitoris, like this, this like, it's just so powerful. I think that like real, um, relevant information like that needs to be taught. I'm not going to tell a high school student, like, go home and, like, look at your body part, but I'm going to tell them, you know, know your anatomy, explore yourself, feel comfortable, because if you don't feel comfortable with yourself, you're not going to feel comfortable with someone else being with you. So that's my opinion on sex ed. Age appropriate, obviously. <laughs> fourth grade. <laughs> no, that was not fourth grade. Yeah, no, no. Just saying. Vagina puzzle in fourth grade, though, yes. <laughs> so we have a number of questions. I'm going to suggests we move it a little quick, more quickly. How do, often is a judicial bypass option utilized for minors to bypass parental notification or consent laws? How difficult is this to actually obtain? It's really hard to obtain. First of all, you, you have to stay within this 20-week guideline. So you, being a young person, you miss your period. You're like, oh, it's my hormones. Like, it's going to come the next month. So now you're eight weeks into it. And you're like, oh, my God, like, I'm actually pregnant. You're too afraid to tell your parents. You're talking to your friends about it. More time passes on. Hopefully someone tells you that you can access this judicial, judicial bypass. A lot of people aren't knowledgeable. So in the communities that I've worked in, it actually has been ineffective completely. Yeah, I mean, it varies by state. And you would hope that um, if the young lady were to go to a provider, they would inform them of you know, the, the necessary next actions. But most... Um, 
young people aren't going to OBGYNs, they're going to uh, pediatricians. So you go for your annual checkup what, once a year. You're not thinking, oh, I'm missing my period, let me call my pediatrician up. So that's also a factor. Also at the same time, um, parents do receive health insurance billing statements and the, the statement's not gonna tell the parent anything about what went down in the, um, it, uh, with, the, with the office visit, it's, it's complete, complete privacy on that aspect. But a parent could ask questions, and I have had um, young people bring this up to me, saying that, you know, I've already gone in for my annual visit with my pediatrician. Like, my parent is going to question why am I going twice in one year or whatnot. So I, I would add, from a Colorado perspective, it varies by state, and in Colorado, it really is a pretty seamless. Um, source of uh, information and approval. However, your, your point is well taken about people need to ask for it. Um, and uh, as a moderator, I'm not supposed to be providing information, so I'm just gonna hop over that. But if someone has a serious question about it afterward, I'm happy to answer the question. How's that? <laughs> Do you think abortion should be legal after viability if the mother finds the child has a life-threatening or debilitating disease? I mean, again, this is something we have to debate about as a society, but again, what does that even mean? Um, you know, viability, does that mean with, without any medical support? Um, a lot of adults aren't even viable <laughs> without medical support, depending on, you know, what has happened to them if they're in some sort of horrible accident or whatever the case may be. So, I mean, I think I can't answer that question. Um, I think it's up to the parent. I think it's 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 their own personal decision, and it's a decision that um, that's, that must be hard, or or not, I don't want to say hard, but it, it could be a challenging situation. Um, and I think it's completely up to the parent. But I also think at the same time, um, we need to then have more support services and better funding for children who are born with known disabilities that are identified um, before birth so that they can live productive lives and can get the best support possible. But, you know, money's always tight regardless. So it's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we want to say let's save money or, or, or let's not put someone through a life where they are, where they're miserable or perce per the perception could be that they're miserable? Or, um, or do we want to fund a life where they can um, be productive and and have a stimulating life, but it's, I feel like, not, I think there's lack of funding on both sides. I would just say when it comes to others determining whose life is worth living based on how miserable they are or not, that's very dangerous territory. No, but I, 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 no, I think it's the parent's decision. It would never be my, I would never say I, as Kathleen, you say you're pregnant, you know, you're, it's good, good example. My, my good friend has a child with Down syndrome and um, her husband's in the army, they're living in Germany, and she got genetic testing, she thought everything was gonna be fine. Baby was born, has Down syndrome, and it's definitely a challenging situation for her and her husband, and she's reflective on it, saying that, um, that she's doing everything that she and her husband can do to make sure that this child has the best support, best, best health care, what not possible, but she also recognizes that once she and her husband pass away, they might not have any other children, they might not have a support network, someone's gonna need to take care of that child. And so she's trying, at this point, is cognizant enough to say, let me put funds together, let me build a trust fund, a nest, so that this person can continue living a life after we're gone. But not everyone can afford to do that. Sure, and um, again though, it's interesting, because then when you talk about parental rights, it's like when does that begin and when does that end? If it's the parent's decision at the beginning of life, but legally that would extend up to 18, but then we're making an exception for them, the child that wants to have a procedure without her parents' consent. You know, So in other words, there are children, there are parents, there are legal definitions for things, and I think it's, uh, it's quite complex, and uh, I think we have to be um, consistent but as much as possible. Yeah, we, I, I'd have an offline with that for you. It's fine. Okay. Um, I think the next one is, is based on a misunderstanding. Why does Ms. Garcia say Planned Parenthood performs abortions with taxpayer funds when that has been prohibited by the Hyde Amendment for 20 years? And I don't think you said it was. No, right? no. Okay, so let's just But you said that revenue is used for lobbying. Right, so they receive about 
approximately, I guess you can answer it because you're the moderate, yep. 500 million <laughs> uh, in uh, federal funding. And then they also uh, have revenue of approximately that same amount from abortion services. Money is fungible. They have money, it goes towards different things. So no, I'm not saying they use the federal funding for abortions, but they definitely pay for lobbying. So the money's coming from somewhere. Can you comment on the idea that this issue is at the confluence of religion and government? Um, I think there's certainly an aspect to that. Um, but um, I don't think that's the whole story. I agree as well. Anything more on that one? No, no, we're in agreement. <laughs> okay. Here's a question from a student. What about in cases of rape? I'm assuming. What about in cases what of about, rape? I'm reading the question. What about in cases of rape? I'm assuming what it means is should abortion be allowed or be treated as a special circumstance in the case of rape? I think we can fold that into the larger debate. Um, it, it varies, but it actually, um, it's an interesting point in that that is always trotted out, right? You know, what about rape and incest? In the instance of rape and incest, excuse me, I can't pronounce things, incest. Um, and in fact, you know, most legislation even um, related to abortion procedures and services and whatnot, it's very, very unlikely that anything would pass without those exemptions carved out. So it's almost always included in any type of legislation. Okay. No, it's, that's completely true. Okay. Um, so we have a couple, we have three more questions on text and several on cards. Um, <clears throat> Marilinda, it seems as though the pro-life movement slash politics in general is dominated by old white guys who think that they have the right and experience. The right and experience. Um, um, well, I would say I'm not an old white guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, I mean, I think, uh, look, uh, politics and positions of power are dominated by old white guys, by and large, in this country, uh, in the public and private sector. Um, hopefully, you know, that is changing. Um, and uh, what was the rest of the question? Is dominated by old white guys who think they have the right and experience. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, that's what they believe. I don't know what to say. I can't speak for them. I'm not one of them. I guess we so. need more women to, to run yeah. for office well, or yeah. for different uh, political <laughs> positions. But I think yeah. that's, that kind of leads to it. Another question for you, Mary Linda. What is your position on the trap laws, which are the subject of the current Supreme Court case in Texas? I don't actually uh, know what that is. Okay. I can't answer that. So I'll essentially, tell you. isn't it? Um, I don't know all my facts off the top of my head, but is it that the the ruling based upon um, on medical centers needing to have cosmetic enhancements to have to meet that, meet the rules of a surgical center. So, an abortion is like a is a quick and easy pr uh, procedure. Um, depending on what stage in your pregnancy, literally takes like five minutes, not even in and out, you're done. But um, surgical centers are where you go to receive surgeries that are less invasive and less dangerous. You wouldn't have a uh, heart surgery at a surgical center. Trust me on that one. But um, these laws are in place, essentially saying that. Doors need to be widened, certain equipment needs to be in place. Things are completely unnecessary. So expensive cosmetic procedures and medical equipment that's unnecessary that are putting clinics out of business because of it. And also at the same time, um, a lot of these facilities are in rented um, medical buildings. So they don't own it. So they then would have to negotiate with their landlord to see if they can make these cosmetic enhan enhancements, which a lot of times the landlord doesn't want any more um, construction done. Um, yeah, I mean, without knowing the law, having read it, um, I actually was involved in a lot of regulatory reform um, in New Hampshire that related to the specialty sector in healthcare, and there's a lot of regulatory um, 
conflict um, again with the with the innovation economy and uh, all that's what's happening in healthcare. Um, there are all kinds of new clinics and uh, specialty um, healthcare provision facilities, centers, um, and clinics that do all sorts of things. Um, so I I'm not surprised to hear what, that this is a issue in Texas. Okay, last last. Uh texted question, at least so far. What importance is male education and discussion in female reproduction? I would say important. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a little vague. I, th um, I, th I think the question is, is it like, do men have a say? I, I am reading the question. I um, Clearly when the questions get cut off after 70 characters, we're struggling a bit here, and this is an experiment, so I would say here's one area where I would recommend that we look at a different model next I'd year. I'd say more <laughs> education and knowledge and information is always better, so. Okay. <laughs> We're struggling a bit with what the question really means. So let's go then to uh, the three questions that I have written down from you in the audience. Um, how does the issue of gun rights relate to reproductive justice? Do you think being pro-life and pro-gun is contradictory? Um, I do not. You don't think, um, you, actually, you don't think it's contradictory? I wanna, no. Okay. I think there's no correlation in my opinion. Yeah. I'm also not like a huge gun rights ag advocate or someone who's well read on gun rights. Okay. Um, as we move toward gender equality in the legal system, with things like paternity leave becoming more common, is it fair or justified for mothers to receive preferential treatment over fathers in custody battles? That part always makes no sense to me. Um, I, don't, I don't think it has anything to do with reproductive rights. I think it has more to do with um, um, uh, the the divorce rights. I don't want to say divorce rights industry, but like the, um, like family law. I think though it, it's intertwined in terms of um, maternity leave, but in terms of custody, I think that um, I wouldn't. I'm not a lawyer, but I wouldn't um, view a case saying to sway towards the mother's opinion or mother's way. But I know oftentimes that happens. I think it's best to try to settle on what's best for the child and then work from there, but be gender agnostic with the decision. Um, yeah, I, I think um, that's a conflation of uh, two issues, but um, I would agree, you know, that relates to the, excuse me, family court system. Um, and in many states, New Hampshire, actually, we did a huge restructuring of uh, the family court system. Um, because you know it's something that needs to be updated um, quite um, you know, to, to keep pace with the needs and issue uh, you know the concerns of society and um, you know I I can't really say I have a, <laughs> an opinion I, I think that the age matters a bit um, you know I would hope that whatever judge is making these decisions is of course being quite objective but I would imagine the you know the age of the child. Um, would uh, sway in one way or another. Obviously, you know, if you're breastfeeding, exactly, or yeah. the case may be, and financial considerations. Okay, we have two more. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm struggling a bit with the writing, so please bear with me. <laughs> it's it's asking each of you to um, speak regarding the following. The oh, the video and the continuing attacks on Planned Parenthood regarding the selling of fetal tissue, which has not only apparently inflamed the man who attacked and killed those in Colorado Springs and has influenced the closing of many clinics. Only recently has the publicity come out 
that these were all lies. So could you speak to the, the videotaping um, that impacted Planned Parenthood and either inflaming or uh, closing of clinics as a result? I'm completely ashamed with how far um, this, this issue, I don't even want to call it an issue, but this action um, got in terms of the American psyche. Um, before everything's doctored, videos are doctored, we put Instagram videos out there and those 15 seconds are never all the 15 seconds together. You're always, you're always mixing and matching things together. So it's really unfortunate that video footage was leaked that was not consistent throughout the entire time frame and that people got all like hot and bothered over something that was actually not an issue at all. Um, what occurred with Planned Parenthood was not illegal. They weren't selling body parts, as mentioned. Technology is advanced with medical research and bioethics. But just like stem cell, you're not selling body parts when you take a stem cell and you uh, have it harvest for, um, for medical benefit. So I think it's a semantics thing that it's actually um, a, a, a vehicle that's allowing there to be advances in the future and people are just um, putting a little PR spin on it to make people upset, hot and bothered. Um, I would just uh, say that again, it comes down to, uh, frankly, objection uh, that there is taxpayer funding for what is perceived to be an abhorrent practice. And yes, there's discussion about the videotapes. Yes, there were edited versions, but there were also the full length ones that were released, but obviously uh, not too many people um, watched them in lieu of watching as would be the case. Um, the, you know, four, 10 minute version with the, you know, most juicy uh, or sensational uh, parts and statements. And in terms of if it's going on and is it research, is it the sale, you know, uh, how all that works, um, I would just say that I, I believe the president of Planned Parenthood, because of the outcry, said that they would suspend doing this, which means to me that they were doing it. So <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. Do you think it's appropriate for males to make a decision on abortion or abortion clinics when they themselves do not go through childbirth as females do? Why do you think they insist on having a certain level of control on this issue? Um, on the assumption that this relates to elected officials and not just men, you know, having opinions on the issue, um, I would say this is a societal issue. Um, we, you know, elected officials are there to make decisions and, uh, you know, women can make decisions about things that relate more directly to men and men also make decisions about things that may relate more to women. But overall, you would hope that there's enough debate. Men speak up, women speak up, and, uh, you know, some decision is arrived at. So um, I guess I, I somewhat disagree with the premise. I don't think men have to be silent uh, completely about any issue that, you know, relates to women. Actually, I took it a different way. I looked at it as if um, someone had a male partner and became pregnant and the female decided it was not the choice that she wanted and the male decided that she, the male decided that he did want to continue with the pregnancy. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about it. Um, I think that, I'm not gonna say a woman's choice is supersedes that of her male partner in this situation or whomever um, got, her, got her pregnant. I think it's important to take all voices into consideration and, 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 see, and see what's a viable option. I hate giving this example because this is, I don't like to talk about pop culture too much, but uh, Sherry Shepard uh, is, is a celebrity who went through this. She had a, a surrogate pregnancy where she and her husband at the time were attempting to have a kid. Um, they decided to get divorced, whatever happened, whatnot, but it was her egg, his sperm, a surrogate was carrying it. Um, they decided to get divorced. There might have been some like behind the scenes um, drama or, or whatnot that went on, but but it's a really interesting case right now to say like is, is she legally the parent because she doesn't want to um, she doesn't really want to have she at the, at the point in the pregnancy when this all occurred she could have aborted it, but but because he has his voice deserves to be heard as well, the the pregnancy continued and now there's like a, a custody debate over 
does custody go to her or not? So I think I think it's really fascinating seeing how things evolve, especially with science and technology, because you know with surrogate pre with surrogate pregnancies, um, another layer is is involved. But um, in terms of like a a, a normal term um, pregnancy, it, it's definitely complicated as well. So I think it's a sensitive issue. So I've got one more text question. If you have a question that you've written on a three by five card, can you? Raise your hand so we can make sure we take your questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. The question, I'm going to reframe it a bit, but um, what, decision, what would a decision about men that women would have a say in? Um, again, I'm assuming this means in the public policy realm. I would assume. <laughs> um, I would say things. Uh, probably within the same uh, realm of uh, sexual and reproductive health. Um, there are a lot of um, decisions, for example, about what's covered under insurance and whatnot, and so there are things that relate directly toward men, be it regarding prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction, I don't know, all of these things that women don't deal with. So women, women do make decisions about those policies. I wouldn't be so nitpicky where I'd say, oh no, I don't want my taxpayer dollars to cover Viagra, but I'd want it to be an equal playing field where if you know there's a necessary sexual health um, procedure or medication that needs to be covered for men, I would hope that on the flip side that they would support what women need to be covered. So I don't think it's fair to, to say yes to one gender and no to another for important medical procedures and care. Okay, we have one more question. Marilindo, is there a disconnect between legislation regarding women's health and the des desires and well-being of young women? If so, how can legislators and young women work to bridge this disconnect? Um, I think information is very powerful, and I also think the uh, capacity and will to listen to each other is extremely important as well. And I think, um, you know, I know I don't want to rehash a lot of the things we've talked about, but I think um, we've covered a lot of complex uh, thoughts on this today. And I think we can all agree there's a lot uh, within that. And so, um, you know, I, I think one, w you know, young women in general is a broad brush, obviously, but um, I think as with on any issue, um, one would hope that people don't rely on sort of the cliched talking points and again, kind of what are the most popular um, marginal arguments on, you know, either side and um, actually try to understand each other's perspective and find consensus. Kathleen, would you want to weigh in on that, even though the question was addressed to Marilinda? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. We have no more questions either by text or by three by five card. Um, and even though it isn't necessarily part of the program, I'm going to open it up to see if anyone has a question in the audience. And if not, we'll give you 10 minutes back and ask you to join me in thanking our two panelists, Kathleen Adams and Marilinda Garcia. Any questions from, from those of you in the room? Okay then, let's uh, thank Kathleen and Marilinda for great, and thank all of you. Great. Thank all of you for attending, we really appreciate it.